You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. If you're hearing my voice for the first time, I really applaud you for taking the time and listening to this podcast. If you're here for Mark Shepard and you're a big fan, maybe, just maybe, you'll listen and you'll go, hey, you know what? I kind of like this guy and uh, it was a good interview and I'm going to give him another chance. That's what we hope, Ryan. We hope that we get a second chance and people subscribe and that they could easily subscribe. Um, we're on Spotify, we're on Apple, we're on YouTube, we're on all these things. We're everywhere. We're omnipresent. Um, ubiquitous, and, even. Ubiquitous. I like that word. It's a good, good word. word. Um, and our, our handles, follow us, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, at Inside of You Pod on the Twitter. You know, uh, we're growing. I think people are starting to realize that we're not just talking, actors talking about junk. We're talking about real stuff, sometimes mental health. We get deep. We get, uh, I just hope you'll listen next week instead of if you're just here for mark shepherd maybe uh you'll you'll stick around also want to tell you that patreon uh really helps the show out so join patreon um it's it's a place where people congregate where they online they uh, a lot of people have become friends established relationships they also get uh, little perks there's different tiers uh, there's the top tier which you get your name yelled at on the podcast at the end and i also send you a box of merch every couple of months with a little letter so there's lots of cool stuff so join patreon if you want to give back to the show and uh, that's patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash inside of you right yes Patreon.com slash inside of you. Yeah, that's right. I'm also, uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful, uh, on Shopify, who's also a sponsor, we have the Inside of You online store. And you can get uh, tons of merch, Smallville merch, Smallville script signed, uh, Smallville lunchbox signed. You can get Inside of You tumblers and coffee mugs and tons of great stuff. And also sunspin.com, that's my band. You can get, uh, you can book the band on a Zoom. Uh, I'm also on Cameo, but you can get cool merch at sunspin.com. Who you know, su- uh, Stephen Amell wears oh, sunspin heard, I've, hats. I've heard of him. I've heard of him. Oh. Arrow, the guy from Arrow. What's he like? A great guy. He's been on the podcast like what four times? Has he? I think so. Huh. Also, I'm going to be Fan Expo in St. Louis, May 13th weekend, Friday night. We're doing a Smallville Nights with Tom Welling. Me and Tom doing a two man show at Fan Expo St. Louis, May 13th that weekend. Whatever that Friday is, figure it out. Um, also May 21st that weekend or whatever that is we'll be in Liverpool at a con so hopefully you join us there and of course June 10th Metropolis Illinois that's going to be a sold out show as well uh, June 17th uh, for two weeks I'll be in Australia Perth and Sydney get down there go down under we'll, down hi- we'll hang out mate oh was that terrible Jennifer Lopez Jennifer Lopez <laughs> I like Jennifer Lopez. That's the, that's the best way I can get that's, into the is Australian that, is that accent. How you do it? I just use the cities. I say Perth, Adelaide, Perth, Sydney, I- Adelaide. Melbourne. 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 Melbourne's a good one. Yeah. Br- um, Brisbane. Gold Coast, Brisbane. Brisbane. Yeah. Anyway, you're, mm. bo- you're bored. Let's mm. just get into it. New South Wales. Uh, this guy is <laughs> New South Wales. I love this guy, Mark Shepard. He's been on the podcast before a long time ago uh, in the name of the father, uh, you know, supernatural. He's, he's just done so much work. I don't need to get into it. He's a really great listen. He is another uh, individual who opens up. And I, I thank you, Mark, for coming on the podcast again. It was a real pleasure. I enjoyed having you in studio. No Zoom. We're doing a lot of in studios now. So without further ado, let's get inside of Mark Shepard. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. You do a lot of voiceovers? Some. I've got a, I spent years languishing in, uh, in sort of voiceover hell. My father was known for having a, the same voice as me, but an octave lower. Even lower? Yeah. So he was, uh, he did yeah. hundreds of games and all sorts of fun stuff. But uh, so I was always the kid. And so I, sw- I finally switched voiceover agents, like uh, middle of the pandemic. And I started doing things like Call of Duty. and Really? You got to do oh, fun yeah. shit like that? I got to play like a 280 pound Irish specialist in the last release. Irish? Yeah. So you had to do an Irish accent. Oh, yeah, my family's mostly Irish. But you don't speak in it with an Irish, di- like, uh, what's it called? The Irish uh, 
Really? Lilt? You've done your research I now? I, 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 well, you don't sound really Irish. Well, not not naturally, but I. Well, I, no, that's what I'm saying. Naturally, I had a thick Dublin accent in the '80s because I was in a big Irish band. Back so in the you day. could just jump into it. Well, jumping into it is weird. The first film I ever did was a film called In the Name of the Father. One of my favorite movies. Right, and that's a thick Belfast. Remember accent. when I pissed on your Giuseppe name, your poor Giuseppe there name, and go. I pissed on it? The that's bad. when I knew I was bad. Dad. On the medal. Right. On the medal. That's right. That's actually a true story, which is kind of brilliant. Um, a lot of things about that film are, are just extraordinary. I have to watch it again because I've seen it many years ago, but did you have a decent little part in that? One of the leads, yeah. You're one of the leads? Uh, Dude, you have to watch it. I haven't watched it since I was in college, so that's me, why I didn't remember. It's, I'm one of the Guilford Four. I played Paddy Armstrong. That's me. Dude. In, that's me in the Afghan coat when they come to London. And uh, Dude. I, I was the first person. I sound like an idiot. Dude. Arrested. No, that's all right. Uh, Ryan. Yeah. Have you ever seen In the Name of the Father? No. Daniel Day-Lewis. I urge all of you. You know that I, 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 when I don't like something, I tell you. When I like something, I tell you. In the Name of the Father is one of the great movies. A great movie, great cast. And true story. True story, based on yeah. a true story, yeah. And uh, I know the man that I played, which was fascinating to me. And unlike any other role that I kind of ever usually have or I'm thought of for, I played a man with no actions. He's literally, uh, Day Lewis's character playing Jerry Conlon, like asked me a question in the squat. He's like, you coming? You know, this is happening, you coming? I'm like, I don't know. It's like he's, he was literally a person who was steamrolled by an entire system uh, without going on for hours. Well, but, no, that, I'm, I, I am interested, without, though. I am. Without, I without going on for hours, yeah. the bottom line was uh, at the time in 1974, um, uh, 21 people were, were killed in an IRA bomb explosion in Birmingham. And, you know, this was the largest fatality since the Blitz. Uh, and then in Guildford, uh, uh, pubs were targeted that were uh, British soldier pubs, squaddies pubs, and seven people were killed in the Guildford bombings. So the entire country was baying for blood. Uh, this hadn't happened. And this was under the edict that, that the IRA, I think, basically had said one bomb on the mainland is worth 100 in Ulster. So if you take the fight to England, you cause attention whereas there was very little attention being paid to what paid to what was actually going on in northern ireland at the time and so these people got caught up the guilford four and their associated families who were called the mcguire seven and a lot of other people um let's just put it this way um at the end of the 70s i think they had to let out 70 irish people from prison who had been convicted wrongfully wow so you, it's it was part of that era of British and Irish politics, which right. is very, very important. And, and my favorite thing about it, whatever your position is, whatever your, your, your belief system is, or whatever your politics are is irrelevant. The bottom line, these were people that were caught up in a mass uh, hysteria moment that had never happened before in England, certainly hadn't, hadn't happened since the war. And two things. One, it was the biggest grossing film in Ireland. It beat Jurassic Park as the Jeez. biggest grossing film in Ireland, which is wonderful. Uh, and, and, and secondly, it's just one of the pieces of the jigsaw that makes it harder to convict people of a crime they didn't commit. Um, the people that did it admitted to doing it, which is something they weren't doing at the time. They were usually saying Chucky Ella, which means our day will come in Gaelic and not referencing their court case at all. Even, right. in, even in the doc, they were just like, we don't care. But they went out of their way to say, we did this. You've got the wrong people for this. And nobody cared. And what was really funny was the British, the British people, as Jerry Conlon said to me once, he said, uh, um, the real Jerry, the, yeah, the real Jerry said to me, he said, uh, he said, it was the British people that got us out. It wasn't the Irish people that got us out. It was the British people that had enough at this point. Wow. There was a wonderful British lawyer called Gareth Pierce, a woman called Gareth Pierce who risked everything and, and managed to, and well, it, don't give away the, no, 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 risked everything and managed to, to get a look at something that nobody wanted to look at. Right. That's the way it's about. It's about human beings. It's about, the product of struggle, the product right. of sedition, the product of stuff. And it's just, and I think it's really interesting with films like Belfast Out and stuff like this that's going on. I think it's really, really difficult to tell an objective view of any part of quote unquote, the troubles in the North, unless you find a, a small piece of it and tell that small piece, because it's such an endemic thing. It's such a, a socially 
polarizing and governmentally polarizing and policy polarizing and, and hundreds of years of sedition and all the rest of this stuff that's going on and gangsterism and all the rest of the crap that's gone on over the years. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I don't think it's crap, but I'm just saying. Right. Uh, just to to be quick, to be brief, is to say that I think the greatest stories told up there are told in music, told in art, told in graffiti, told in, so, you know, as in song, as in plays. There are, there are but fragments and moments that allow you to piece together how these things could have happened right. and why this area foments certain behaviors and certain things, the Shankill Butchers, you know, the, all these inc incredible stories that don't, I mean, they exist in other formats in other countries and in other political situations, but not quite like this. And the wit and the humor, I was talking to Billy Connolly about this years ago, the wit and the humor and the music and the art is beautiful in the midst of somewhat chaos, what other people view as chaos. But the daily life in Belfast in the 80s is very, very different than anything we've, we've ever experienced. Let's put it right. that way. And I used to play in a band in Ireland that was very big and very political and was actually sanctioned under Section 31 of the Broadcasting Act in Ireland several times, et cetera, et cetera. I opened the Joshua Tree Tour with you too at Croke Park. Wow. A very, very political band and used to play with a particular flag, uh, a, a plowing stars from... John B. K. The Workers Flag of Ireland is the fast way of doing it. I could do this for days. We could have seven days of talking about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I still, you would see the limitations of my knowledge and understanding. You, you, you've said things that I have no idea about. But it, it, you know, I mean, everybody has a. There's, there's been it's, a lot it's of. It's the history there. There's been a lot of reasons to keep a romantic view of it as it's not romantic at all, but to actually investigate it and see it. You, yes, you investigate it and see it, and there's a brutality and a sadness and a. But there's a beauty and a humor. I can't tell you how dark and beautiful the humor is. Um, I'll tell you a Connolly story one day. Yeah. We, 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 we always used to stay in one of two hotels, which is the Europa or the Wellington Park in Belfast. And they've got, you know, 20 feet of chain link fence going upwards outside and barbed wire. The most bombed hotel in Europe is in Belfast. And it's, the culture isn't driven by that. The culture is driven by the opposite of that. The culture is driven by the want to survive, the want to the want to succeed, and and to be in Ireland in Southern Ireland and be part of um, it's like, escapism. Well, to be but to be in Ireland and see us as like a, almost a third world country for so long, with a lack of investment, lack of funding, lack of anything, and then suddenly the eighties hits and we we beat England at football. <laughs> <laughs> I have a pair of boxer shorts with the score on it from that day. I, I think you could have robbed any house in Ireland on that day. <laughs> you know, Jack Charlton, who was English, took Ireland to the World Cup. I mean, this is a bunch of part-timers who were playing. Right. I mean, and that was kind of the beginning. You two got signed. We got signed. All Jeremy these, Bono. Many times. He did the music for In the Name of the Father. It was a really funny thing. Jesus, we could talk about In the Name of the fa Father for an hour. But we were in... We were in um, uh, we we're at the Savoy Cinema and in the middle of Dublin, uh, where my dad used to go to the cinema as a kid, in tuxedos, and you know, we're showing showing in the name of the father in Ireland for the first time, and everybody is there, and Bono's called down from the stage, and he's in the middle of the Europa tour, Zuropa tour, right? And I come down the stage, and he goes, "I know you." I said, "Yeah, I played Paddy in the film," and he's like, "He's like, no, you are." So he goes, "I know you." I said, yeah, I, I used to be the drummer in Light a Big Fire. He said, yeah, I said, once upon a time, I opened for you, now you're opening for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, I love it. I mean, you know. but That's awesome. But though. to be in a country that at the time that changes yeah. so much and it's about youth and it's about. It was a good time. It's incredible. The 80s were incredible. And we never, I don't know if we, we truly believed there would be any version of peace or any version of, of, of change in our time, but we could feel something fomenting and changing. Yeah. And it, it took an awful lot of people, an awful lot of work to even get to this point. Yeah. It's, it's just magical. And I, so I think the stories about the North, the greatest stories about the North are these little stories about people, not about the politics necessarily. And, and they shine a light on the antidote right to the suffering and the difficulty and 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 just the some of the mayhem inside of you is brought to you by wondery marilyn monroe 
She is far and away the most famous actress of the 20th century. Her name and image are synonymous with the American ingenue. And in an all new season of Wonderies, even the rich hosts Brooke and Arisha pull back the curtain on her legendary life and career. Much has been said and written about Marilyn in the 60 years since her tragic death at 36, but what often gets overshadowed is the absolute force of nature she was while she was alive. Marilyn was a woman ahead of her time in so many ways. From the moment she stepped onto her first movie set, it became clear that it was her acting and intoxicating charm that brought her film's box office success. But her rising stardom threatened movie studio execs who wanted starlets they could control. From major studios holding her to unjust contracts to studio execs making sexual advances, Marilyn privately endured all the worst parts of Hollywood sexism. And overcoming those barriers often forced her to choose between her dreams and her sanity. The inimitable Marilyn magic, it wasn't an accident. She created it, and it became the biggest movie. The inimitable. The inimitable Marilyn magic, it wasn't an accident. She created it and became the biggest movie star in the world despite being underestimated and ridiculed at every turn. Even the rich has all the juicy details of her spectacular but all too short life. Uh, I am fascinated by Marilyn Monroe. I don't know anyone who isn't. Uh, if you walk into my house, what's the first thing you see in the living room? Marilyn Monroe. A giant portrait of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, I, I just loved her, uh, enamored by her. Uh, I love stories about her. This sounds like it's going to be amazing. So don't take it just for me. I mean, millions of people love Marilyn Monroe. How do you, you like Marilyn Monroe, don't you? Who doesn't? Uh, who doesn't? Who's not fascinated by that? Listen to Even the Rich, Marilyn Monroe, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Inside of you is brought to you by Magic Spoon. You know I love my magic spoon, Ryan. I know you do. You know why? Why is that? Because I could finally have cereal again, and I could feel like a kid again, and this time I'm eating cereal that's healthy. Cereal that I can eat that's not going to make me go, gosh, why did I do that, man? It's nostalgic and healthy. Yeah, you know, I think it's just important. You know, my my daily routine starts with a big bowl of magic spoon, and uh, I, I've, I've noticed fewer cravings throughout the day. Um, and more energy to hold me over until lunch. I, I, it, that's a good thing. Uh, trying to cut down on carbs, uh, unhealthy food, sugars, and whatnot. Why don't you tell us? Because this is pretty amazing. We, look, by the way, Magic Spoon, when you're a kid, you, you have all these cereals, and you love these cereals, but they're terrible for you, and you're going to have a freaking heart attack if you're my age and you keep taking, you keep eating these cereals. But so Magic Spoon made a cereal that you can eat as an adult, that you can enjoy, and even as a kid you can enjoy it but it's a little healthier. Uh, it's a lot healthier. Ryan? Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. Build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream, maple waffle, blueberry, cinnamon, plus the newly formulated honey nut flavor that will now be added to magic spoons permanent collection uh, i don't know how you don't try this stuff i've had friends call me text me come on man is this magic spoon stuff good and i always say yeah what do you want me to tell you it's delicious try it i had in the studio months back i had ryan try it and we, we both admitted man this stuff's really good it's delicious it really is it's really i'm craving it right now i swear to god i'm craving it go to magicspoon.com slash iou to grab a custom bundle of cereal and be sure to use our promo code iou at checkout to save five dollars off your order and magic spoon is so confident in their product it's backed with a hundred percent happiness guarantee so if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. I mean, what else do you need to hear? Cereal, deliciousness, money-back guarantee. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash IOU and use the code IOU to save $5 off. And thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. We do love you. I noticed that you always bring up like uh, – you bring up your dad a lot, mm -hmm. and you. I look on Instagram. Boom! There's a, the pictures of your dad. Well, last time we talked, he had, like, he had just he passed just away, passed, and 
Who how, is, yeah, how are you dealing with that now? It's really weird. My dad was a, was a wonderful actor. He was a really interesting actor. Never really made it, made it, but actors knew who he was and, and just loved his work. And he was in everything for a long time. That guy. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's in this. Oh, he's in The Prestige. Oh, he's in Needful Things. Oh, he's in the, so He's in all these movies and all these games and this voice like this. Yeah. Morgan Shepard here. <laughs> and we weren't very close when I was a kid. And then we became very, very close when he moved over here to do Max Hedron. And we sort of fixed whatever problems that we have by working together, acting together, directing together, doing all this crazy stuff we did over the years. And, and so any successful moment, any happy moment, any sad moment, I'm used to picking up the phone. He either lived downstairs from me, across the road from me, or down the road from me for the last 25 years. So it's hard we lived to lived on Laurel Canyon together, moved right. him. But I'm used to picking up the phone and saying, Oh, so blah 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 blah. And I don't have that. Do you still think about it? Like I pick Always. up the phone all the time? But my dad was in serious distress by the time that he passed. And his passing was such a relief. I could feel it was such a relief for, for him. him. He was done at 80, you know, 86, I think. Um that I wouldn't have wished him an extra day. I wouldn't have ex wished him an extra minute. The selfish side of it, of course, I want him. I want him around forever. Of course, but to have for, to be a person who, who studied history and had stories and and pulled people together and which people just loved him. Um. To not have that in the last five six months of his life, very very quickly he descended into, um, uh, you know, he just didn't get enough oxygen and blood to his brain. He had some, he had some issues and problems and, and they all got worse. And instead of being able to have open heart surgery, he ended up passing before that was possible. And, and that, was this was like three years ago, two and a half years ago, two years ago, I think. Yeah. Two and a bit years ago. Um, I, it, it escapes me. It feels like yesterday. And sometimes it feels like 10 years ago, but it's not, it's not tragic. There's nothing tragic about it. And when I think of my dad, I think of really positive things. I think of fun things. I think of things he said. I, you know, I, I just worked with Timothy Dalton for the last couple of years. Oh, nice! I remember seeing Tim Dalton. There's a great picture of my dad and Tim Dalton. If you look it up, doing the Romans at the Mermaid in England, which I saw as a kid. And it, it, my dad was playing Caesar. It, it was just like, but I, that I know him from then, and I end up working with him later. And every time I see John Reese Davis, it's like, please remind your father he's far, far older than I. It would be, he would always, say. <laughs> but. Um, he he was connected to so many people, but never as a as a big star. He was just somebody that people liked and did. I mean, he did Gettysburg. He did he narrated Jesus. Gettysburg. He's the first voice in Gettysburg. So you know, he's just a lot that's of a, those are big shoes to fill, right? right. That was the whole thing. Did you feel it? like that no, when you were going? Up? You didn't feel like absolutely not. I refused to be an actor for that reason. Um, <laughs> but I don't act like him. We've taught together. I mean, I'm more of a guess a Chekhov trained actor and he's he was in Peter Brooks Royal Shakespeare Company so he did Marisol and Broadway he did all the all the great stuff that ever existed he worked with Uta Hagen he taught at, at the actor studio in New York he did all this stuff so he's part of that era of theater but his transition into film was a tough thing for him because he always wanted to be an American and so when he finally got over here to do Max Hedrum he did Max Hedrum here, and then he did Gunsmoke. He did the last Max Hedrum, the voice. No, he was uh, he was Blank Reg in Max Hedrum, the punk, really the punk guy with the six wheel bus, the pirate uh, radio station. Yeah. So he came over to do that. He, I think he signed to Gersh, and then he was in the last Gunsmoke movie. He's in so many things that are just fun, and he reinvented himself again and again. And if, what what it was is like you know. I, I started acting because I did this play, and then it got big, and stuff happened. And I remember the front page of the calendar said, I'm not an actor, I'm a musician, my dad's an actor. And I just got like drama critic circle award or something stupid. So it was like, <laughs> it was just one of those things where it, I didn't want the path he had because I didn't like you, like watching the negatives of what our job is. When you see people that don't love it or yeah. struggle with it or start to get angry because the work isn't there or frustrated because they're getting older or whatever and the time is getting harder for them. And there's no there's less and less joy involved in it. Right. And then the other side of that is watching somebody who's happy when they're working and miserable when they're not, which I hate. Have you ever been that guy? Yeah, many times. My kids will tell you that. <laughs> really? Yeah, my kids will tell you So what, what, what made you miserable? Because you haven't drank in 32 years. Right, but waiting is an action that consumes all other actions. 
Waiting, the action of yes, waiting yes. destroys and consumes anything else. Yeah. So being busy doesn't work for me. I'm too smart to con myself into the idea that I'm busy. But actually doing something and being sober is part of that, as you realize, you know, just for me in particular, if I sit still and the world revolves around me, I get into a hole and then drinking looks like a... Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if it did for you what it does for me, you'd be doing it right now. Wow. If it did, does for you, if heroin, you never alcohol, heroin. butane, Zippo lighter fluid. You did anything you can get your hands on. But I didn't think it was like that. But on reflection, looking back, I was trying to find something from the age of 12 that would fill that void. And then I pick a profession. Well, I was a musician. But then I picked a profession. I told you my first job, I came second. And it destroyed me. You didn't get it. It went to Tim Roth. First film. Was it Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? No, pre that. It was it was Made in Britain, which was a fantastic piece. And I didn't get it. And so I got a phone call from the casting director the next year. I said, uh, so you drive, right? I'm like, no. Good. I'm glad you can drive. It was one of those calls where they were obviously in front of a bunch of producers. And they said, so we want you to go to Spain and do this movie. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm doing an album. Refused. Absolutely refused to do it. Would never step into that arena again. And that was the hit with Terrence Stamp. Tim Roth's second film. <laughs> I'm entirely responsible for Tim Roth's career. No, he's a fabulous <laughs> actor. He's a wonderful actor. And there's a reason why they were right for him and they weren't right for me. But then to do all that stuff, tour the world, do all this stuff I did, live in Ireland, blah, 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 come back to America and then do this play sober. And then go, wow, this is like jumping off a building and finding out you got wings. It's not like jumping off a building and hoping you don't hit the pavement. It's literally like jumping off a building and going, Take a breath, breathe out. Everything you need is here. And it was kind of scary. And the weird thing is my drumming suffered as a result because I didn't pick up a pair of drumsticks for 20 years because my drumming was all connected to my drug use. I didn't, I mean, I batch it. And it was Billy Moran and, um, and, and Mike Borher and Steve. Yeah, and, I love and those Rob guys. Going, Loud and swing. Going, you want to get up and play this song? I'm like, no, I'm good. So when I got up and played, and they were like, oh, you play? I'm like, well, yeah, I've always played. I hadn't picked up a pair of drumsticks in 20 years. And then really? suddenly I'm back playing with Robin Hitchcock and doing all this stuff. I'm, like, it's, I'm really weird like that. My anxiety and my stress. So I picked the worst so you job got, Yeah, you, so you have a lot of anxiety still. Yeah, 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 of course I do. And I've got, you know, I've got three kids. And you don't have drinking to kind of... To buffer me from it. But you, you and I have sat, recently we've sat in a bar and watched unnamed actors totally unnamed actors will never be named that we, we, you know, I wouldn't even say what get smashed. We're in. No, not get smashed, but getting smashed is easy, but you can, you watch them deteriorating into a place that you, that it just doesn't fit some people you can see, and you can see the one or two of them start behaving badly, start being uncomfortable doing that stuff. That's me. And yeah. I also see other people, stressful day, have a beard, have a beer, do whatever. Your buddy, Tom, brilliant. Watch him have a drink. He's the happiest dude on earth. Oh, my God. He's, 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 I watch him go, I'm so jealous of the fact that you can actually sit there and not destroy things being your size. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> by the way, he adores you. He's just a he just was, he crashed at the house and he just left this morning. But when I told him, his eyes just lit up. He's, and he was like, he's so great. He just, he's so forthcoming he just you know he just he's such a sweet guy and well, tom's a really honest dude it's really weird because you wouldn't expect when you see him in smallville and you think of you know i start then i started to think of god the pressures he must have had to be that for that long in that situation so i've i've you know i'm not usually number one on a call sheet there's been a couple of times i've been close to being but but it's not generally the vibe here and what i loved about you with with lex luther is you at least had room to play. You are not constrained by the rules of number one on the call sheet or number two on the call sheet, where you're the last person to have any information. Uh, <laughs> you got, it's like, really? Oh, no. Oh, we're doing happened. that now? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. You right, but yours is like, ha-ha, you know? You right. do, you've invented a new version of how to screw with number one. Well, on the call you sheet. were kind of like the Lex Luthor of Supernatural. It wasn't designed that way, but it's kind of where it ended but up. But Crowley was sort of, you know... He was middle management when he started. And, and like me, like Lex, I, you had to give all these monologues. You spoke a lot. Oh, God. Do you miss that? Jensen once asked me. He was, he was being very polite. But he asked me one day, he goes, okay, i got to ask you this. So Bob and I were wondering, how come 
when you when you're doing your off camera dialogue, you're perfect. You, 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 everything's right. And then we turn around onto you. It takes you three takes or four takes to get it. And one time he asked me this when he was had a couple of drinks, so he was nicely lubed up. <laughs> and it was like at three in the morning or something stupid. And I said, "Listen, you're the lead. You're basically talking bollocks." <laughs> They give me a story that they think is funny. They give me lines that they think is incredibly funny when they've written it on paper. I now have to read that, find a way to believe it, and find a way to make it actually mean something. Otherwise, I'm halfway through going, ah, oh, this is cack. It means nothing to me. So I said, that's the reason why. I'm carrying the bloody plot or I'm carrying the the counterplot, or I'm carrying the sea story, or I'm yeah. carrying, it's, it's- For how many years? I did eight. You did eight seasons. And don't, listen, I'm telling you, I love those guys. Yeah. I love those guys with all my heart. Yeah. Absolutely. We had ups and downs. I mean, the, 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 the thing at the end was the weird thing. What was the weird thing? Nothing to do with the boys. It had nothing to do with anything else. They didn't ask you to come back? Well, no, it was worse than that. It was kind of tacky. It was- it was like, well, we don't think we have enough money to pick up your option next year. <laughs> Are you serious? Well, because they were working out how to do what they were going to do with a story that they needed to continue beyond, you know, into the 13th and 14th seasons and rest. And I think a particular showrunner remained nameless um, was trying to kill me for about four or five years. And it was just funny because uh, I kind of knew because I knew the rest of the writers. But I didn't care about it. That wasn't the problem I had. The point being is I went from being a guest star that refused to sign a contract for five years to now I'm three years. I mean, Warner's put me on the poster before my deal was done. They put me on the video box. They were just like, well, you can't sort of ignore him. <laughs> and, then it, and then it was like, take it or leave it. And I think it was majorly about getting the boys out on a Friday more than anything else. Than anything right. else, which is smart. I yeah. mean, for God's sakes, they've been working for, for, you know, 10, 11, 12 years at the time. And they worked their ass off and they just moved back to Texas and all that. I mean, it's just smart stuff. And they got families and they're starting families. But I used to get away with going, no, I can't do that. I'm going to my kid's soccer game on Friday, so I won't be there. And then they were like, take it or leave it. And I was going through a divorce at the time. I was like, I could just disappear or I could just pay my bills and what I'm supposed to do, and take the job and say, thank you very much. So I was grumpy for a little bit and they tolerated me being in a bad mood for a year or so. And then I started to make friends and things were wonderful. And... Then they come to the end. They go like, "Well, we don't know if we we can take up your option." And I was like, "And I said to Bob, I think it's what pissed Bob off is I said, if you take me off the poster, I'm not coming back because I don't do windows." And that was not received well. <laughs> really, you just it, said that. Well, yeah, it's exactly what I said because the truth. Of you the felt matter, like you'd earned it. Well, the funny thing was, I mean. With all due respect to my friends, I am so grateful for myself and for all my friends that they yeah. had work for this amount of time. It was good work. And that everybody on that crew was was just fantastic. They were all at my wedding, for God's sake. Yeah. You know, it was it was a big deal. Plus the fans. The fans But the fans fans are amazing. Yeah. Said, that, that's 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 without saying. But I was playing I played the same scene in season twelve five times over five episodes. And I was like, all right, gig's up. You know, it, the gig is up. And so, you know, everyone's kind of like, oh, they won't get rid of you, they won't get rid of you. I'm like, I'm done. I know I'm done. You knew it. Yeah, I knew I was done. Transpo what came, scene came was to this? Me. What season was this? 12. 12. I was killed at the end of 12. And Transpo went, like, take your car home. I'm like, well, I don't have transport then. It's like, we'll do it. So I took my car home like a month and a half early, two months early. I was taken to and from set every single day. I was taken home. I was dropped at airports, brought back. It was just... I was looked after. That was sweet. It is sweet. And the people don't have to do that. They And they did. And it was, and I think what surprised everybody on set on my last scene is I'd already spent two weeks saying goodbye to everybody. And I didn't want to make a speech for the first time in my life. And I think they got a little upset that I didn't make some big speech because I'm big mouth. You didn't say football. anything? I said, thank you very much and walked away. I'd spent two weeks talking to every single person. So I you, you didn't have you. to say anything? I didn't feel I had to say anything, but I think it got a bit weird. And then, I don't know. I just do you said, do you get invited to the supernatural conventions? I don't. The, no, you don't. No, I, I I did seventeen, and then it was really weird for my friends. It was weird for my friends. What do you mean? Okay, so Ruth plays my mother. Wonderful, lovely actress, beautiful human being. Worked her butt off on the show. Career should have been my uh, ex-wife. It would have been even better. Right. It would have been fantastic. She'd have played my ex-wife 
in the show, it would have been just something else. Right. But okay, she's my mom. Doesn't really make sense in the canon. She's my mom, but it, we made it work, and it, and she's just brilliant. She's just wonderful to work with. And really, do I want to go to a convention where every single question she gets is, "When's Mark Shepard coming back?" Because yeah. that's what happened for a year. Yeah, that's not cool. They got work to do. They got things to do. They deserve better than that. Right. So I opted out of those at first. It was very uncomfortable for a bit. And then I opted out of it after I'd done my 2017 stuff. And I went on tour with Robin. Robin and Hitchcock. I, and I, I did an act for a year or so. I was miserable. It was like everybody was having a party and I wasn't invited. I'm not talking about the convention. I'm talking about just generally. The right. Series. And that's not nobody's fault. And I genuinely, with my whole heart, have never begrudged them a moment, a minute. Right. Do you and talk I, to them still? Yeah, I talk to everybody. You talk to everybody? Yeah, I talk to Jared on occasion. It's a, a, people come over to the house. I see Kim all the time. Kim's daughter swims with my son. Kim Coates. Yeah, I love Kim. Um, just did Rob Rich's podcast after a, a period of time, which was fun to do. I want to interview them just to annoy them. Uh, Richard Spate. I love and I love him, and I had them on the friend. podcast, and, and Rob Benedict. Yeah, they're fantastic people. Right. And, you know, I've played with them. But like in any real family, you have ups and downs and dynamics. And the smart, Absolutely. Thing, the smart thing for me to do was to back away because they were in an ongoing position, and they were still pushing. And they managed to go to 15 years. And it wasn't for me to be, you know, the thorn in the side. Did you ever that. lose your temper and yell on set? You're like, this is fucking shit. No, I don't think so. Never. Oh, I have lost my temper about a couple of things, but it, but I did it. But never on set. No, it's not. I don't think it's my thing. I mean, the trouble is, though, with my face and my tone, people think I'm annoyed when I'm. <laughs> people think you're just not happy. Yeah, and I'm. I'm Mark, are you to... okay? So yes. there, there was a director that I really hated. Oh, I bet I worked with him. Yeah, he did. Um, and <laughs> he was dancing around this idea of doing this particular stunt, but he hadn't told anybody. And then suddenly he takes me aside. And apparently Pellegrino was supposed to stick a, a, a one of our um, demon artifacts. You know, the pointy thing yeah, that you yeah. kill people with? Yeah, what are those called, Ryan? Blades. Demon blades. Demon <laughs> blades. blades. Richard blades. Yes. Go ahead. Dashing blades. <laughs> but I mean, I've, God, I've dropped more of those out of my sleeves than anything you can imagine. So he literally had the, the kung fu dummy, you know, the bog kung fu dummy in front of him and this contraption. And supposedly he was going to stick this thing up my nose, which had a breakaway tip and squirt blood on my nose. And it was going to be Pellegrino that did it. And I'm like, that's not going on my nose. Isn't <laughs> You're not sticking a, a solid piece of metal up my nose to do a gag from Chinatown, which is what it is. Um, I'm like, oh, God's sakes. So I actually called Jim Jim Michaels down. Never done that before. Who's Jack. Jim Michaels? It was the producer, the de facto line producer, producer. And I'm like, am I in trouble because I'm not doing this? He goes, no. So two weeks we've been arguing about this crap. Don't worry about it. And then Mark Malosh, the wonderful um, uh, visual effects guy, came down and goes, I can do it with green screen. Just use the rubber one. I knew you were going to say like, that. Thank you so much. But it, it got caustic, you know, there's, there's moments, there's ups and downs, but. It's easy to get. It's, but the behavior on that set was exemplary. Nobody would tolerate it. Jared and Jensen wouldn't tolerate somebody losing their temper. It's just right. not okay. You don't throw things. And everybody knows who he did that. The crew would go, ooh, what's wrong with you? You know, you don't. These but the, but, but the, it's hard. People say you got to separate business from, you know. And it's sometimes hard because, you know, I, I dealt with it with, uh, you know, Warner Brothers and going through negotiations. And they just, they know how to really cripple you. They know how to make you <laughs> mentally just. Never did it to me because I'm not that important. Well, they they had a way, but it's it's amazing how it could change your spirits. Because I was always doing stand-up comedy on set and everybody's like laughing and I'm like farting and doing Christopher Walken and, and action and I'm yep. Lex Luthor. And then all of a sudden. Many, you're worthless. You're not important to us. How you're not, many, without how many saying fights it, do you get? Why don't I get a bump this year? It what? just well, it, it was it was a lot, but it was also one day one of the uh, the my friend Greg Beeman, who's one of my favorite directors and producers, he came up to me and we've done some projects together. He said, "Hey, I know what's going on, but they've got nothing to do with it. The studio doesn't give a shit how you feel. They don't know you, you know, on set, but I could see your disposition. Your you, don't let that affect yeah, you. Yeah, no, I continue get it. to have and and I it was an awakening for me. Oh, but I, it's still it was it was I, was I was going through a divorce and on and on different occasions, both Jared Jensen and Misha 
I go, you're right. And literally made sure I was okay. Or somebody said something that had happened, which hadn't happened. And one of those things, and it's like, you know, one of them takes me out of dinner. And he's like, is this going on? Are you okay? So you and had people was, who cared about you. Always. And that's the thing. And it was, it was a big boys club. I mean, they, we played hard. I mean, watch any of the nerd HQ videos. <laughs> and that's like, right. we've done a year's worth of publicity in two days. Yeah, Misha and I get to do one day of stuff and they had to only have to come in on the second day and do it. But we are like running out of things to do after year seven. Yeah. You know, and it's, what can we do? But right? we are the custodians of, of, of these are the plot points. These are the changes. This is what's going on. Don't talk about this. Do talk about that. And it was wonderful. And I, 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 don't, I don't regret a second of doing it. I don't. I miss the camaraderie of the time around season eight when we were all in the in the you know, that season eight is the end where um, I'm tied to a chair in a church and Jared and myself and, you know, it was three days, three days on stage in sequence. I'm crying, quoting girls, HBO's girls. It's nuts. I'm singing Bowie. It's it, I'm being injected with human blood and I'm falling apart and he's falling apart. And Jensen did six hours of off-camera dialogue one day. I mean, if you're talking about class, what was the amazing thing? Crew never made a sound for three days in between the in between the shots. Wow! Didn't make a sound. Wanted us to be able to do the best we could do. That's awesome. we had support everywhere. Yeah, we had support everywhere. I mean, that's 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 a big part of it. I can't I can't talk I can't talk more highly about the boys' behavior. Yeah, especially towards those that weren't very good necessarily when they came. They were they would be even more generous. Unbelievable. It was always, that's the way. They come from good families. Good they, leaders. No, they have great families. Yeah. And that you can tell. You meet, have you ever met either Jensen or Jared's family? I they're haven't. just good You people. could tell he's raised they're just well. They're good just good people, you know, man. They're just good people. And Until so Jared has a few beers and then you're, you're Jared's, in trouble. Jared's easy. <laughs> I love Jared. I love you, buddy. Inside of You is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy. I can't tell you how many emails or texts or messages I get from people telling me that better help is helping them. And I really love that. I love uh, talking about something that works, that helps people, that is a sponsor on the podcast where we talk about mental health. It's very important. Ryan's still with better help. I'm still with better help and it's still helping. helping. It's it still, still helping. helping. I like hearing that. You know, people don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, uh, teeth grinding, even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating, overeating. Stress shows up in all kinds of ways. And in a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time, here's your reminder to take care of yourself, to do less, and maybe try some therapy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Ryan, you like to see people. I do. I think it helps. I do too. I like yeah. to see the person I'm talking to, but that's just me. If you don't feel like seeing a face, you don't have to. Don't you have could to. also text. You could have. You could do whatever you want. Yep. It's so much more affordable than in-person therapy. Trust me on that one. Uh, going to in, uh, in-person therapy is, is is so expensive. It's I, I'd say some cases it's triple, quadruple the cost of better health hmm. by far. Uh, you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. I believe it really can, truly. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and inside of you listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash inside. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. Give therapy a shot. BetterHelp Online Therapy. Inside of You is brought to you by GEICO. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, add the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. 
Hey, <laughs> what about working with um I know you worked on Firefly and Badger with Joss Whedon. Uh-huh. What was I mean now that all this shit came out? Do you remember anything that you kind of saw as, you know, rubs you the wrong way? And you're like, oh, you know, in hindsight, that was, or w- w- did you never see anything like that? Was he a joy to work I, with? I did, I did Firefly and I did Dollhouse. Dollhouse. Right. So here's the thing with Joss. I'm not one of Joss's guys. I wasn't in Buffy. I wasn't in Angel. I wasn't in any of that stuff. I'm not one of Joss's guys. Go-tos. I'm not any of those things. Right. But the role he wrote in Firefly, Firefly he wrote for himself. And I, uh, Adam Baldwin was a, is a buddy of mine. And he said uh, about halfway through the 12 hours of shooting this scene, he goes like, you know, he wrote it for himself. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. He's extraordinarily smart, ridiculously smart in the same vein. Intimidating? I don't think so. I don't, but I've, I've never had an issue. I don't, I don't, I don't I'm not that guy. I, I don't think if you hire me to do a job, I'm supposed to be the most interesting 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes of whatever that job is. That's my position. Right. That's, that's nothing to do with my ego. That's to do with I'm not very good at standing in the back and holding a book or, or doing It's not my thing. So if you hire me, I'm the object of attention, and I'm going to take the air. And, right. but, I'm, but I'm not I'm not ungenerous. I'm not, I'm not dismissive. Yeah. But. You know, the, we did the end of season, did the end of season nine where, where Jensen's in the bed in Supernatural, right? And he opens his eyes and they're, they're Black Demon. Everybody goes nuts and got Warner Brothers to find all the reaction videos for it and put it on the DVD because it was so much fun. And Tom Wright was the director. Remember Tom Wright? Mm. He painted all the pictures in Night Gallery. Oh, wow. Wonderfully grumpy older gentleman who is just brilliant. Right. And he did Baby, he did the episode Baby that everybody loves. He's done some amazing stuff. He was just funny and brilliant. And and he worked for Hitchcock as a storyboard artist. I mean, he, he's that sort of pedigree. Jeez. And he's just a fantastic human being and fun to play with. And this scene is here and it's me talking for whatever it is, 27,000 minutes, giving a speech and making him open his eyes. And I said, what do you want me to do? And Tom goes, well, I see the opening shot as you in silhouette in the doorway. Rest is up to you, have fun. I then spend five minutes trying to find a place I want to be. And they go, hmm. And then suddenly I find this armchair and I go, my God, this speech is all about truth. It's his Abraham Lincoln. I'm literally thinking of the Lincoln, the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> going, yeah. oh my God, I've got two arms. Oh, this is weird. No, I won't be on a couch. I'll be over here. He let me play for five minutes. He works out how to shoot it. That's not because I'm, you know, I, I get to be in charge. Right. But he's like, here's your parameters. Go have fun. That's what we always want to hear. As an I'm actor. not the guy. In his, Some people that frighten. Have you had line? Have you ever had line readings from a, from a director? Sometimes uh, they couldn't articulate what the fuck they wanted, and it was terrible <laughs> direction. So I said, "Hey, tell me exactly how you want me to say the fucking line." And I would, I would, uh, great. And I'd just go boom, boom, twice the way they said it, oh. just to move on. Oh, I don't care. I'm like, let's go. Well, yeah, what is, well, just give me a line reading. I was dying in 24. And the director of the episode, another one of two. We'll get back to Joss Whedon. Yeah, but there's nothing to say about that. All right, fine. Because I mean, like, so I get a phone call. Like, Joss wants you to be in Dollhouse. I'm like, okay, can I see it? And again, it says Tanaka. I'm like, well, obviously, wasn't the first choice for this, was I? <laughs> <laughs> so I show up at Fox, and I go, and he meets me at the gate, and he's like, hey, so you know, we're doing this. I said, I'm keeping the name because I knew you were going to say that. And so I was like, he said. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe your stepdad was Japanese or something. I said, oh, I married a Japanese guy. He goes, this is Fox. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was always incredibly respectful. I mean, right. he, was, he was- So you never saw that part. He wrote nice things about me to other people that wrote with me and they passed it on. Right. But he the only thing he was asked to do, Battlestar, back in the day, do an episode yeah. of Battlestar. Which and you did. And he said- You did the reboot. The the. the Proper battle star, yeah. The one we got Emmys for, right, right, than, right, right, right. Other than costume, um, <laughs> so he was going to do one of the finale-ish episodes somewhere in that last group, you know. And I think I can't swear to it, but I would think he actually asked, "Do I have to know the ending to do this episode?" And I think Ron said yes. He goes, "I don't want to do it. I genuinely don't want to do it. It would spoil." I arrived at Dias. He's like, "If you tell me the end of battle, I'll kill you." I'm like, "I'm going to tell you." Best kept secret for six months. Wow. It was brilliant. Nobody wanted to know. Nobody wanted to know. It was like. Do you know I've never seen a series? 
You'd love it. It's West Wing in space. It's West Wing in space. I it's saw not, the pilot and I was oh, blown the, away. The, the pilot, pilot was blown is the, well, the, well, the miniseries is the, the opener. Yeah. And then That's episode a, one is uh, about the sensory deprivation. All right, I'm going to watch it. Don't say anything. I think it's brilliant. But it's serialized. You cannot jump into it. It's just. Right. It's like. It's cliffhangers and. Oh. Right, right, right. And what, just, are, what were you going to say about 24? Because so I want to know what it was like. Because so Kiefer was on the podcast. I want to know kind of like your experience. Kiefer and I go, Kiefer. great. Kiefer yeah. knows I'm sober and never has ever spent a minute. I mean, I keep hearing all these things that people say about him. And I've never encountered that. What he has, and I, I can't really speak for him, but I can say what happened around is he doesn't like it when people be behave unprofessionally. And there's plenty of actors that are like that. It's like, please be quiet. We're trying to work here. Christian Bale. Yeah, I mean, I understand that. <laughs> you just don't want to do it when your mic's on. Right. Or go as extreme, or, perhaps. <laughs> well, he's so far down in the hole in what he's doing. I mean, it's. I, I've been, we've all been there where I've been like this. I've been, but it's more of a, it's, you're upset, but you know, like, so it's like, Al, for the fuck of fucks. What are you doing? My, you know, banging nails and doing. But Good my, Lord, son. Yeah, and but, then you laugh it off and you go on. But he just went mental, you know. Wait, it, it, it's just, <laughs> we always get the tip of the iceberg. You know, not to be crude, but you fuck one goat, you know. Now <laughs> now you're the goat fucker. Well. Doesn't matter what yeah. else you've done in your life. But you've, you well, you kill goat. one person, you're a murderer. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's <laughs> kind of different, you know. <laughs> I suppose if the goat died, there would be well, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it. well, but the, the truth of it is, is, is the intensity, the intensity in performance, the intensity, and in we never have enough time in television, and the, the and the belief. For, you know, you come in as a guest star, you're in a very, very different position than you are somebody who has to work sixteen hours a day, five days a week, for X amount of years. Sure, you're getting the money, but you have to go to your trailer and do all your business, all your home stuff. And no it. life. You've got no other life. Right, 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 right. You know, and so I think producers were very clever with, with Jared and Jensen and, and Misha at least giving them the option of some spots here and there. So my character was written up, I think, to just give some relief. Yes, yes. From that. Could you do it right now? Could you do if somebody offered you a lead role in a TV series, yes. a one-hour drama? I'd do it in a minute and a half. You could do it. Yeah, I'd love to. Physically and mentally, you think you could handle those hours, love those it. being the lead. I'm never happier. Never happier. And the weird thing is, is I'm getting a bit older. How old are you? 58 coming up. Are you 58? Yeah. So as I'm getting a bit older. You don't like 58. I'm 50 you. in July. You're a baby, though. No, that's not a baby. I'm half a fucking century. It's all that hockey. That's the problem. Yeah, probably. But uh, <laughs> no, there's a, a 58 years old. I love doing the telling of stories. Doesn't matter if it's music. You've got your, you've got your bands. You've got great stuff going on. I've watched your progression through the different versions of the bands and playing, and, and you love it. I just enjoy it. Yeah, you know, but you know, you don't enjoy it. You love it. I love you enjoyed it. it. You know, you you do it occasionally, but you yeah. love it and you pursue it. In a way where I'm not going to be upset by the outcome of what happens. I know that I'm doing it yeah, out of passion. You don't have to happens. sleep in a bus. Exactly. You could, you could exactly. go stay I'm in four doing seasons it to make a if living. you want to. Right, right exactly. Um, but the truth is to get a chance to act is, a, is, a, is an extraordinary thing. You know? Um, to be paid to do something that you love to do is a privilege beyond all other privileges. But let me ask you, do you, are you an actor? Cause I know some actors. I'm an actor, yes. <laughs> do you know, cause I know actors that are just like, I, I want to work to work. I just want to work to work. I don't care what it is. I want to work. Do you, or- Can't do it. I'm not that- I, we, You have to love it or we, you have to be passionate about it or you have to see something that you could do with it, right? Well, on, on the premise that every, every time an actor gets a job, another actor dies a little. Um, yeah, good, good man. We're, we, it brings us all up. Yeah, well done. It's yeah. like, no, we don't feel that. It's like, damn. But I'm not, I don't know why I'm not, I've never been good at commercials. I've never been good at soaps. I've never been good at any of those things. It's not that I never I'm, did a soap and I never did a commercial. Jensen was like, my God, that boy did like 68 pages because he wanted to go away for five days or something one day. I'm like, you did 68 pages of soap dialogue in a day? I, I don't know how he did that. He's amazing. I don't I mean, know how he did that. He commits. But it's about committing to it and the words are rubbish. To me, the words are everything. And I have to find. It takes me a minute. I have to find 
some truth in something, a truth, not the truth, but a truth. To connect with. I, otherwise, why am I saying it? Or what I, I don't, I don't, I feel so self-conscious when something isn't in a reality that makes some sort of sense to me. It can take me by surprise. I don't need to control it. I don't need to direct it or, or make it be something. I'll find it sometimes to be something really funny when it wasn't supposed to be. But the truth of the matter is I own it. And if I, unless right. I own it, I can't. And that cuts me out of about 60% of the work that's come across my, you know, and there's roles that came up. They're huge stuff for me. It would have been groundbreaking changes in, in my what's this? What's this Doom Patrol? Doom Patrol is amazing. God damn it. What is Doom Patrol? I haven't seen Doom Patrol. Do you know anything about it? No. So I don't want you to give it away, but how do you? How would you describe it, it in away. a it's nutshell? A 19, it's a 1960s comic. It was a 1960s comic that got redone by Grant Morrison. You know, the guy did Happy. Mm -hmm. And that's that, right? Grant, wonderful Scottish comic book, graphic novel, TV shows, writes, 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 right. writes. Sort of, sort of another Irvine Welsh, another, he's, he's another Neil Gaiman in a way, but, but maybe less prolific, but just as interesting. And he was very much the antidote to, to Alan Moore, whether he likes it or not. They were very contrary, you know, there's a, you know, Watchmen and, and his stuff was very different. And he read it in the eighties on Vertigo comics and Doom Patrol was actually the original prototype. I think that X-Men stole from. Really? There's a chief in a wheelchair. There's, you know, Elastic Woman. And, and you're a regular. And, uh, I'm bizarre. I'm doing my usual. I'm not going to, I don't even want to Mark know. Shepard. But you do a lot of episodes. I'm playing Constantine. Wow. But he's not called Constantine because Grant wasn't allowed to put Constantine in Vertigo comics in the 80s. <laughs> so he was watching with Nail and I. Of course. Which you love. Well. And so he drew it as Richard E. Grant. So I, I got a hold of Grant and I was like, a buddy of mine was doing um, Green Lantern with him. My buddy Liam Sharp, the artist, mm. is doing Green Lantern with the one they just done. That's just brilliant. Everybody goes, "Oh, great! Right, we right. can make a film now." Yeah. Um, so I got on Grant. And I was like, "So it's it's uh, it's Richard E. Grant in in with now." He was like, "Yep." I'm like, "Okay." I said, "With all the love in my heart, I don't think I can play it quite that effete. I think it'd probably be, be a bit more like a drunk Mad Eye Moody." He's like, sounds good to me. And he's not actually a producer on the show, but he's-, he's, he's So that's kind of your character. It's Constantine. It's consumption. And, how, and consumption where, where do we alcohol. find it? Where do we find this? Well, the show was put out on DC as a, and they tried to pre-tease it by doing it with Teen Titans. And they put Cyborg into it, Javan Wade, who's wonderful. And they put him across and they tried to do it that way, the typical DC way of doing it. And nobody watched it. Mm. And they did this first season. So you've got Timothy Dalton, Matt Bomer in bandages. Mark Shepard. No, Matt, no. Matt Bomer, uh, Brendan Fraser, Diane Guerrero from Orange is the New Black and Encanto and a lot of other things. April Bowlby, Two and a Half Men. Remember Candace? Yep. Candy in Two and a Half Men. So good cast. No, and then the bad guys, Tudyk, playing this- Alan Tudyk. Playing this diminutive Mr. Nobody, which is really wonderful performance by him. Javan Way playing Cyborg. And who's running it? Jeremy Carver, who ran the interesting parts of, of, of Supernatural, the 8 through 10, 11 wow. era. And it was like, oh, my God. And I'll just tell you this. The entire town disappears up the ass of a donkey in the second episode. Have you seen it? Uh, I started it. I hadn't finished it yet. <sighs> so... HBO bought it. They went, what the hell? This is genius. Really? So, so it's not Supergirl and it's not The Boys. It's something else. It's about mental health. Cool. And it is truly disturbing and beautiful and funny and begs the question, which is why things have changed. Why isn't Brendan Fraser in everything? Yeah. Well, he's, <laughs> there's he's a resurgence so now. There's a resurgence. Well, as a result of Doom. He's like, he's, he's, he's this beautiful heart yeah. in this. I love this show. I truly love this show. And it is, we've done three seasons. Three seasons? It's going into the fourth season. Wow. And I'm a, a recurring character that you can't kill, so. Yes. Do you, have, do you have a deep voice like that? I have my voice. That's a deep voice. I actually got to say the C word in my first line. Cunt. I literally had to email Jeremy and go, I, I'm saying, I avoided the C word for 35 years. <laughs> at this point or 40 years 
and he said, oh, let me have a look. Oh, yeah, it's still in the script. <laughs> it's like, this is, says the humor, I guess. I'm like, okay. It was the weirdest thing to do. Was it exciting, though? No. You know that Americans can't say it. Right? I know. Everyone in England can say it or no, Europe. No, no, not can't say it. Literally cannot say it because they get guilty the moment it slips out of their mouth. Uh, you saw me say it a few, yeah, few but, seconds ago. Yeah, there's but no you, guilt. you look slightly uncomfortable. Was I uncomfortable? Slightly. Oh. Because there's a knowledge that it's a bad word. In England, it's a different thing. Let me hear it, Ryan. Say it. That's going to sound weird. Say it. Cunt. It's yeah, awful. that was. Ugh. He's a cunt. <laughs> but everybody, it sounds better when you say it. Yeah, but I mean, he's, a, he's a cunt. Yeah, but I don't sound. No, I don't sound like Dick. He's, he's a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> he's a real cunt. Well, last, well, two years ago. Cunty, cuntish, and cunting made it into the Oxford English Dictionary. Mm. Your cunting daughter? Do you know what she did? That's from The Exorcist. He goes, your cunting daughter? Yes, that's, that's very old language. But it's a little, <laughs> that was a little cunty. That was a little cunty. It was a bit of tad <laughs> It's cunty. a weird word because it, it polarizes so many people. Yeah. The reason why I don't use it is because it's used appallingly. Right. It's used in an atrocious manner. She, and now yes. it has taken on a meaning other than the vernacular that it was. Should we bleep it for this episode every time we say it? No. I mean, I'm not you a believer in censorship, but do I, you know, am I going to have to have a, a conversation about how it, uh, how, how this <laughs> affects women or whatever? It's, 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 sh it should never have been. I'm not, I don't, but I'm not a believer in the banning of language. Right. It's intent. That's important. Intent is everything. Yeah. You should be able to say what you want. I mean, we, you know, language is there for that reason. But it does kind of put you in a corner if you say certain things. Sure. Hey, this is called Shit Talking with Mark Shepard. You've played <laughs> it before. These are rapid fire from fans, my patrons who give back to the podcast. Join patreon.com slash inside of you and uh, message me and I will message you back. But these are questions that they have for you. The patrons. That's a sunspin. That's my band's coaster. You like that? Real slate. Real I mean, slate. How much are you selling those for? Mm, not much. Eight bucks. That's pretty good. You put cheese on it, too. You can put cheese on there and cut it. Yeah. Cut the cheese. Leanne, I have been hearing some rumblings of a possible Firefly reboot. Do you foresee that happening? I'm 58 years old. <laughs> what does I, that mean? Like, yeah, if they do it, they're certainly not going to use me in it. Why not? Because I'm 58 years old. What are we you don't do? look 58. What are we going to have? We're going to have Firefly the retirement years? I mean, what's going on here? Well, and how old was your character? They, when they reboot anything, they reboot. He was young. I did the, God, how many years ago did we do that? 15, 20 years ago? 15 years ago, probably. But would you do it if they asked you? I'd do anything if they asked me to do it. If it's something that's something I love. Yeah, I want to do this, by the way. I want to go to this place. But Lisa H says, I just want to say I met you last July at Mad Monster in Arizona. And you were a delight. Your panel was phenomenal. And I absolutely loved how you called out the tiring same old questions. Oh, I just, I have this nonstop thing of going like, that's a terrible question. Why ask it? You know, I, you know what it is? You get bored. If you're sitting on a stage and you have somebody asking questions like, like we could do this. And then we put an audience in front. What are we giving them? Nothing. You and I would know that like, you know, Nerd HQ, you play with them. That's the fun. Right. The fun is that you involve and play. So I'm I'm doing the Morton Downey Jr. meets Phil Donahue, grab a microphone and go walk in. That's what I do. Yeah, I go high five babies. And you have fun. Go see people dressed as- You enjoy it because you want them to enjoy it. People dressed as Castiel are an open season target for me. And Misha played Castiel, yeah, right? Yeah, so, so I'm like, what did you come as? And you get these wonderful girls who go like, Castiel, and I'd never heard of her. <laughs> You just fuck with people. No, it's it's an it's a sort of unwritten agreed rule that they're important to me. They're not strangers. They're important to me. We're all in this together. Let's entertain the people sitting at the back. Let's entertain everybody. Let's do something that's fun. Yeah. And somebody gets out a microphone. That's they're nervous. I'll go over and 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 be like, okay, what's going? What's going on? What do you really want to know? I notice that when I'm signing autographs at conventions, I'll look over when I see you. And you take your time with every person. Like, it's unbelievable. Like, you really... Do you know how much courage it takes to dress up, go to a convention, and tell the entire world in front of you what you like, 
what your favorite thing is and then meet somebody who you've never met before and you have an opinion about or an idea about (laughs) yeah and you go up and you've been practicing saying something for an amount of time and say you suffer from anxiety or depression or any of the things which the themes of supernatural tend to support a lot of these communities because it's about family and fighting and not giving up and all these things and a sense of community which is important but then they come up and they practice something for for three months and they say something and it's a non sequitur because it i say something first by accident like oh nice hat and they're like you're a big twat i'm like oh fuck that was a line from something <laughs> that's that something they're just trying said. to do a line right, 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 right. okay okay i got it my job is to is to welcome and, and yeah care. do you remember what i did well, I threw something at you playfully, but I didn't know you were talking to somebody who oh, was talking God. to you about something that it was just like happened. really heavy. It was like somebody's father or mother just died. just died. And I'm just trying to get his attention, but I don't hear this. And I, I flick a rubber band paper wad at him and it like goes, and he just turns his head and you kind of just looked at me like, look of death. Not now. Yeah. No, because, I, because <laughs> yeah, we weren't that, being a dick. You were no, like, no, no, go, no. Oh, you shit. can do whatever, that, we can do whatever the hell we want. I was just going to go, God, if you hit that person with that, it's going to be the worst day of their life. Yeah. Michael Rosenberg, who me in the face? Like, you know, after I said my oh, mother died. No. And I mean, it's like, like, you never know where people are at. No, you and never if know. if they're willing to share with you where they're at, then it's a lovely thing. Dana asks, what was the worst job that you have ever had? As a job? A job. could be anything. What was the worst job that you go, oh, that sucked? Built, designed, and maintained video duplication systems in the valley <laughs> when I first got sober. <laughs> That's a little tongue twister right there. Uh, I've been a motorcycle courier, pretty weird, in London. Um, I haven't had a lot of jobs. I ran a bar in Hollywood for a long time. Really? The what power, was it called? The Powerhouse. The Powerhouse. Well, Gary Twin was the was the main guy, and I was the other guy, and that was kind of way out of my league. Drunk, dry, and sober. I ran that place, and I had to stop. I was like, I can't be here. I why can't am I do here? This. No, why am I here? <laughs> Somebody pulled a gun on me one day. Somebody's like, it was crazy town. It really was crazy. Town. Maya P. What do you miss most and least about being a touring musician? Energy of crowd. Hmm. Instant gratification, instant response. Organic. They breathe, we breathe. A bowl, F. A bowl. It's a bowl. If I messed it up again, a bowl, you can kick my ass. Hello again, Mr. Shepard. You did me a solid by doing a video for my wife, the just because I love her video. My question is, what's a guilty pleasure of yours, i.e. a song, wardrobe, or movie? Guilty pleasure. Top Gear. What's Top Gear? British TV motoring show that was on for years. Jeremy Clarkson. You loved it? I still love it. I was just watching it again recently. There's so many guilty pleasures. Yeah. You know, what boys are back in town live from from uh, Live and Dangerous then, Lizzie. That's a guilty pleasure. Will F. Leverage reboot. Do you see yourself headed to NOLA? Um, I wasn't invited for the first year. I love those guys. They're really, really good. And I, I, Dean Devlin is the last independent television studio here. Yeah. Right. And I love him. And John Rogers, who was part of the creation, Amy Berg, who created my character in that. Some really great writers and great people. Aldous Hodge, for God's sake, is a wonderful, wonderful actor. And Christian Kane, who we've intersected off and on oh, over yeah. many, many years. Great. And lovely cook, too. He's a great, great chef. Really good chef. Nice. But he's just a sweet guy. And I was there to be one thing. And then they did the Amazon thing. And they sort of went, well, I don't think he fits in what we're doing. So I took a bit of umbrage with that. Mm. But you never know. They've been picked up for another one. So right, maybe. Do- Go ahead. Dean gets just blasted all day with, what about Mark Shepard? When Sterling coming back? Does he? God, Stephen Moffat said to me, he said, would you please tell your fans that I don't cast things the way that they think I do. I write what I write, and then when I've written it, I work out who I want to play it. Right. So why is 50,000 people saying, you need Mark Shepard in Sherlock, or you need Mark It's like, they don't understand. A lot of those writers don't understand that sort of barrage. Didn't you do Doctor Who, too? Mm -hmm. How many episodes? I did uh, two episodes at the beginning of season six. Do you still get people coming up to you for Doctor Who? It's wonderful. It was in Nixon's White House during the uh, space race. Really? Oh, God, yeah. And I'm playing a... Uh, a former FBI agent. Do you know I've never seen Doctor Who? It's fantastic. I'll I'll tell you where to start. To what I mean, you're going to. Which Doctor do I start with? No, well, 
the thing is what you grew up with is your doctor, right? But me personally, it's not a bad place to start. It's not to go into Monster of the Week stuff, but but there is a really interesting arc that starts at Fish Fingers and Custard. You can do this for him. Where Matt Smith starts at Fish Fingers and Custard, goes through Pandorica, through Christmas, into the stuff I did in season six, which is written by Neil Gaiman, written by Mark Gatiss, written by some of the best people. So, so you watched a lot of episodes. No more than anything else. I mean, I watched Doctor Who as a kid. So uh, they, they came to they, they came to me. If it wasn't for Jim Michaels at Supernatural, I wouldn't have been able to do it. They flipped a schedule around in England so I could do it. They offered it to me, and I was like, of course. And they said, when are you coming over to do the prosthetics as the older me? That'll make sense to you when you see it. Um, and I said, why don't you just ask my dad? <laughs> That's right. So he goes, they went, would he do it? I said, of course he'd do it. So I called my dad, and I go, like, you doing Doctor Who? And he's like, it didn't even ask him. He just said, you're doing Doctor Who? He goes, is it all cardboard and bits of string like it used to be, you know, for sets? <laughs> I'm like, no, it's fabulous. And I sent him the same stuff that I'm telling you about. And he, and he watched Matt Smith. He would go, this boy is incredible, beautiful actor. And he suddenly got that thing of, it, of why it's so precious to so many people. Wow. So he what, played you older? He played the older me. What a genius thing. And he had to do it in Utah, so he had to get dispensation from SAG to do it as non-union. Oh my God! Just tell for Morgan me. here. <laughs> I've got to do this thing, but it's non-union. So you want a waiver? I don't know. Do I want it, Morgan? You want, want a waiver? You want to? Oh, okay, fine. Then I want a waiver. <laughs> do you do you still get uh, anxiety, like crippling anxiety, or do you know how to deal with it? And what do you do for the anxiety when That's you get what it? It's about. I've got kids. I've got kids. I've got 22, 16 with type 1 diabetes and five, nearly six, six in a few days. Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm wired badly for that stuff. I get to panic. I've got to support them. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. What if this? What if that? What if this? I drive myself up, up the wall, you know? Luckily, they've all got good therapists. <laughs> do they have therapists? Your kids have therapists. Yeah. I think everybody should be in therapy. That's good. I got a 22-year-old who's smarter than I was at, at 30. I got a 16-year-old who, who's smarter than all of us. And I got a five, six, almost six-year-old daughter who's just fantastic. The five or six-year-old daughter goes to therapy? No. No. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. That'd my be kids, interesting. My boys, my boys are, um, yeah, they have their own thing. You know what, though, in this world? We didn't have that shit growing up that they've got now. No. Think of the idea of dating at, at 16 or 20 years old. Now. It's it's like you've got to have consent forms and go take a trip to the go take a trip to the doctor before you go out on a date. It's craziness. <laughs> yeah. You know, everything's on video. All the mess ups and the stupid crap I did as a kid. If we'd have had camera phones, you I don't be... know if I'd have made it to 20. Yeah. I think that goes for everybody. Yeah, but it's like, so it's so harsh out there. It is. And they're smart kids, you know? Yeah. I love having you on. I love being You know, here. it's great because you just, you're one of those guests that you can get deep, but you also tell good stories and it's easy to talk to you and I don't have to sit there and I just sit back and enjoy. Yeah. Well, don't you feel like that? It's just like all of a sudden I'm in Ireland. I'm in <laughs> Belfast. No. Now I'm on the fucking – now I just picture your dad and he's going to Utah to film this. and I can. But, it's just very visual. But the, so. the truth of this is when we discover, when we go do conventions or we go – that's where we usually will see each other and stuff, you know, if mm -hmm. we're out and about. And it's post-show. We're doing other things, but it's post the show that people are seeing us for. So our conversations are not about the show we're on. We're all in the same boat. We're all part of that same thing. Right. And we're just trying to get a break and trying to be kind and nice to the people who have come to see us and try to elevate their day and elevate their weekend and get through and then go home to our to our families and, and get on with the rest of our lives, having, yeah. had a, having had a good weekend. But we're all in the same boat. There are so many of us who are in the same boat of a certain era and group. And at any one given moment, any one of us could be, you know, the next Timothy Dalton. Well, not Tim. Tim special. <laughs> not Tim. I got a eight foot poster of Tim in my dining room. <laughs> Do 
he really? From an Italian, he's, he's a gladiator. Timothy no, Dalton. He's in a Centurion's you, uniform. You know who Timothy Dalton is? Yeah, James Bond. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Of course you know that. Yeah. Yeah. Who's things? your favorite James Bond? He's actually the second most popular James Bond in England. You know who my first, my favorite is? Sean. No. Oh, God, what's wrong with you? Roger Moore. No. That's who I grew up with. No. I love Roger Moore, Moore no. in Jaws and in... Uh, the guy who played Jaws, uh, Richard Keel. Mm -hmm. Richard Keel's in. I things. love Richard Keel. I met him. Yeah. Richard Keel in in uh, Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. The book. D don't get in the ship. It's a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> How to cook man or whatever. To serve man. To serve man. man. To, to serve, to man, serve yeah. man. Well, hey, thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be inside of you. Will you come back again? Anytime. We have to. We'll have to pick a different subject. Maybe I'll interview you next time. You know, that's a possibility. Has anyone interviewed you yet? My brother did a long time ago, but you know, you know who wants to do it is Zach Levi. He wants to interview me. Zach would be really good at that. I'd actually would I think that would be brilliant. Oh my God. He'd go right after me too, wouldn't he? He'd just be quick. We <laughs> we'd just disintegrate into long stories, but he'd Well, it's just fine. No, no, but he'd be quick. He's such a smart boy. He is, he is. such a smart he's boy. He's a good guy. Too. I love him. I think he's a truly truly special person yeah i think so too he's a wonderful guy and so is tom and tom's part it's the same thing man it doesn't matter who's whose turn it is in the barrel right now you know and sometimes we gotta wait a little longer than everybody else but we're all happy when we're all okay does that make sense yeah, yeah. we are all happy yeah when the next thing it's like yeah okay that's good i'm happy yeah i agree you know and that's the big i think that's the biggest deal for any of us is that it, this is a tough job made tougher by circumstance right now mm -hmm. and we just grind our way through and if you're lucky you end up like tommy lee jones yeah exactly and try to avoid the word or hackman you know what i like about mark what do you like about mark he can talk he sure can and that's saying it in a good way it's not <laughs> like i have to pry shit out of him <laughs> take some pressure off of you doesn't it, it certainly does there's nothing worse than going oh so anyway and they're like uh twice Okay, um, so where are you from? <laughs> Brazil. Uh, so um, did you like doing that movie? Yeah. Okay, go fuck yourself. <laughs> so, 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 so. Yeah, I mean, geez, Louise. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for being on the podcast. Tell us what you think. Write to us. We're on Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, YouTube. Watch on YouTube. Subscribe. Uh, subscribe everywhere. It's it's really helps when you subscribe everywhere and you listen wherever you can, and uh, we appreciate it. We're also on the uh, the Patreon. If you want to join Patreon, Patreon by patrons give back. They help to keep the podcast alive. Go to patreon.com slash inside of you. Um, I'll also be in St. Louis for Fan Expo um, May 13th weekend, Liverpool May 21st, Illinois, Metropolis, Illinois, June 10th. We're doing Smallville Nights with Tom Welling. It's a two-man show. It's going to be great. A um, lot of fun stuff going on and a lot of cool things to tell you here in the future. If you keep listening, there's some really exciting news coming up that I'll tell you about. But uh, I just want to thank you for listening to today's, to today's episode. Um, and uh, now I'm going to read the top tiers. Do we need to do anything else? No, they know where to go. Well, tell them. <laughs> you go to at inside of you pod on Twitter and at inside of you podcast on Instagram and Facebook and you can follow the damn thing. That's what you can do. That's what you could do. So if you enjoyed it today, uh, I would also ask you guys, if you really love the podcast, spread the word. Force your family in a nice way to listen to the podcast, to subscribe to the podcast, to spread the word. And because uh, we'd like you, we'd like to be one of your choices when it comes to podcasts. Uh, here we go. These are the top tier uh, patrons. Nancy D, Leah S, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Nico P. I'm going to keep reading and I'm going to do, and you say angry. And then you, or you could just say different emotions. Different emotions? Right. Yeah. So here I go. All right. I'm going to start out with just Nancy D, Leah S, Sarah V, Little Lisa. Yuki, angry. Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H. Sad. Nico P, Robert B, Jason W, Kristen K, Allison L, Raj. C. I Elated. sound like sor sorority boys guy. <laughs> really? Yeah, Dina. Hey, why do you let them treat you like this? <laughs> Elated. Joshua D. CJP. Jennifer N. Stacy L. Jen S. Jamal F. Janelle B. Kimberly E. Mike E. Eldon Supremo. Quizzical. Ninety nine more. <laughs> Santiago M. 
Chad W, Leon P, Janine R, Maya like, P. Like Tom Cruise. Maddie S. <laughs> Belinda N, Chris H, Dave H, Spider-Man Chase, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Jack Tab- Nicholson, Ray H, Tabitha T, Tom N, Liliana A, Talia M, Betsy D, Chad Horny. L, Chad L, <laughs> Rochelle, Marion, Meg K, Travel, Dan and Big Stevie W, Angel M, Rihanna C. Give me another one. Buffalo Bill. Corey K, Super Sam, Deb Nixon. Michelle A, Jeremy C, Andy T, Cody R, Gavinator, David C. Gary Oldman. John B, Brandy D, Yavor, Camille S, The C, Joey M, Willie F, David H, Adelaide N, Omar I. I'm trying to think of one. Lena N. Design OTG, Eugene and Leah, Chris P, Nikki G, Corey, Patricia, and Heather L, Jacob B. <laughs> no, what is that? It's like the count. <laughs> Bienvenidos a los Estados Unidos, Jake B, James B, <laughs> Bobbitt, Abel F, Joshua B. I don't know what I'm doing. Walking. Tony G, Sean R, Megan T, Mel S, Solando C, John B, Caroline R, Darren B, Rob E, Paul C, Christine S, Sarah S. Eric H. Tom Welling. Spring. <laughs> Jennifer R. I don't. I, I have no idea. That's a tough one to do. Tom Welling. Um, but guys, uh, thank you, all my lovely patrons who make this possible, and thank you, Jason Nelkin, my wonderful editor. Thanks to Ryan, my wonderful engineer, and my cohort. Thanks to Westwood One Cumulus for supporting the podcast, uh, and. Uh, Thank you from myself, Michael Rosemont. I'm here in the Hollywood Hills of California. And Ryan Taylor is also here in the Hollywood Hills of California. <laughs> we love you guys. Be good to yourself. Be good to others. Have a great week. Thanks for choosing this podcast. Look, not every one of them is going to be a slam dunk. I thought today's was a slam dunk. But, you know, stay with us. We're trying to give you good, good stuff here, and we love you. And uh, keep us around. All right? We'll talk to you. Talk, we'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs>